ask Pastor Mike to forgo the uh, video intro just to because I know God gets the credit, but we are incredibly spoiled. Wednesday night, I sat and les- listened to that song that we put in for this week, and I'm just honored and grateful. And I know you are, but we're spoiled and we take for granted um, Scott Self, who leads worship. Scott is an incredible person, an incredible singer. Um, Honestly, that is next level quality right there. And his passion and love for Jesus just is such an amazing thing. And I just think, I just think so much of Scott. I know you guys do as well. So make sure to encourage him and tell him that because that ain't, I mean, that to me brings back visions of Dollywood when he was an angel at Christmas and Scott was such a staple there. And uh, just we have him week after week after week and year after year after year, such a consistent guy. Obviously our praise team, so cool. And you're like, Mary, did you know it's Christmas already? So if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter one and Luke chapter one this week. While we do that, Severe will give it up for our South Knoxville campus. Let's lock in with them and our Greensboro campus. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day to everybody. It is Mother's Day, so I wore my white jacket. My mother got me this jacket for Christmas. She got it at Buckle. That's one of my favorite stores. Um, I love buckle jackets and buckle jeans. You're like, Brent, I, you wear jeans. I have like four pair of jeans. That's all I And, and uh, this jacket, and mom gave it to me, and I, and I opened it up, and it was one of those moments at Christmas where she had this look on her face, and I'm like, it's, it's, it's awful white. She goes, do you like it? I know you like buckle. And I'm like, I love it. So I wore it for Christmas. I I wore it one other time, but I'm wearing it today for a couple of reasons. Number one, to honor my mother. My mother is my hero. I will cry if I don't watch it. She is my champion. She is my source of wisdom. And I don't care what anyone says at all. She is the greatest pastor in this church by far. Give it up for Pastor Pat, my mother, everyone. I love her so much. Very good. Um, we're in a series called 23 and Me. Um, I really, really love this series. It's kind of taken a life of its own. I love it that we can just lock in biblical characters that we can relate. And we're asking a simple question. When it comes to our lives, 23 and Me is that, that kit that you buy and you check your ancestry and your health. So we're checking our DNA and our spiritual health. And so here's the question. Is it genetics? Is it DNA? Is it just, I mean, some of you go, well, Brent, you're, you're a really good guy and it seems like you're a good Christian. If not, you really fooled us all, but you, you seem pretty legit. And it's probably because your mom. Your mom's awesome. That's why you're awesome. I agree. My mom's the best in the world. You're like, no, she's not. My mom's the best. I mean, I, is it our genetics? Is it our DNA that make us who we are? Or is it choices in our lives? Do we have to make a choice? Is it choices that we make either good or bad? We've looked at Adam and Eve. They had good DNA, but made bad choices, right? Came from um, God, right? I mean, that's pretty good DNA. Okay, the week, week two, who'd we look at? A guy named Lot. His uncle was Abraham. Came from good stock. Who comes from good stock in this room? Raise your hand high. You're like, uh, hopefully most of you are like, not me. You don't understand. I, I, um, Lot's uncle was Abraham. Couldn't get any better DNA than that, but Lot made some serious bad choices. Anybody make bad choices again this week? Well, let's just keep that rolling. We're like, some of y'all, listen, or you're not learning at all. Week after week, you're the same person raising your hand. The week after that, we looked at a guy named... Daniel. Daniel came from good stock, but made good choices, but still had a difficult life. He did not have an ideal life. He lived in captivity most of his life, but he was what? A man of conviction and a world of compromise. By the way, thank you for those who wrote down and laid those uh, communication cards on the altar. I continue to pray for you every single day. I love that. To me, that is one of the standout moments of this series, that you would be bold enough to come forward and say, you know what? I need to be more of a person of conviction in a world that it's so easy to compromise. Last week, we looked at a guy named David. Give it up for our South Knoxville campus pastor, Matt Samler, who did an amazing job on David. David, of course, had good DNA, made horrible choice, then ended up making a good choice. And we understand that, hey, you know what? God is a God of a second chance. How many people can say amen to that? I love it that Matt Samler, some of you are like, man, Matt had a testimony. I didn't know he was wheels off crazy. 
Well, he came to this church and he wasn't saved. He actually lied. I love his testimony that he would be bold enough to say, I lied to get a job at the Miracle Theater singing about Jesus. He's a horrible person. Wasn't that a horrible person? <laughs> But yet, God got a hold of his life. He began to uh, get involved in the church, began to walk in Christ. He helped us open our South Knoxville campus from day one. And this year, he has now come on full time because God has called him into ministry. It doesn't get any cooler than that, in my opinion. He is a living example of what this church is all about. And he is a living example that God is a God of a second chance. And I'm so, so thankful. This week, obviously, we're looking at a a lady named Mary. You're like, oh, okay, I got now, now I get it. Mary, the message is short. Some of you are like, Brent, it's already like, wow, we got, I got, we got Mother's Day things to do here. Um, Matt preached like an eternity last week. Are we going to cut that down a little this week? Yeah, my message is short because you know the story. It's very familiar to you. Mary is so relatable because sometimes we look at her and say, wait a minute. She, we, we know she comes from a good family. She's an innocent girl. She doesn't really make any bad choices. There's a purpose and a plan for her that she doesn't quite understand. Although we sing, Mary, did you know? Mary did not know. Everything that was about to transpire in her life. The Bible says some very weird things. And so I know we only look at her at Christmas time. Cue the snow. We look at her through these rose-colored lenses like, Oh, it's Mary's awesome. Wouldn't it be awesome to be the mother of Jesus? It'd be awesome to be Mary. Really? Think about that. So for a lot of us, here's what I want to do. It's a very simple message. We're going to talk about the word blessing and favor. So you might not come from the greatest family. You might have been raised on the, quote, wrong side of the tracks. You might have made bad choices, but yet you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And sometimes we walk in life, and just by the things that we can see and touch and feel, we're like, man, is God really blessing my life? We hear that a lot, even in Christian circles. Hey, God wants to bless you, and and God wants to bring favor. And we typically think of that as tangible things that we can touch, right? I mean, I wrote it down. You can write a few things down. Turn with me me if you want to, to Matthew. We're going to read in just a minute. But think about this. Americans, us, Christians today, we tend to believe when things are going well, my health is good, my relationships are stable, my mental health is sound, my finances are good, then we have God's favor and blessing. And to the contrary, when we see a series of unfortunate events happening, relationships we value start coming apart, we have poor health, or anxiety starts to set in, we think this. God is against us. God has somehow removed his blessing from us. But this is not a very popular message, but write this down for this week. Ready? People who are in God's favor do tend to have great difficulties in their lives. Don't ever be sold the bill of goods that, hey, you know what? When you make the right choice that everything is going to be perfect, the car will be running good, you'll live in the subdivision you want to, your kids are way above average, your, your, everything is perfect. I promise you that you never know what a day holds and there are circumstances, there are desperate circumstances that can come into our lives. And if we don't watch it, we, we tend to walk by sight and not by faith. So we're like, God, you're not really there. You must be against me. So maybe there's no plan for my, my life. If there is a plan for me, whatever's going on in my life, I'm going to trade those plans for plans that maybe you have for somebody else. It's kind of that purpose thing. That question, it's always that question, do we know and believe that God has placed us here for a purpose? If God has a purpose, then surely he's got a plan, right? But remember, his plan is not always our plan. So my simple message is this. We tend to romanticize the past a little bit. We tend to uh, think of things in nostalgic ways. And for Mother's Day week, I figured this would be good, especially for Mary and Joseph before we read it. Let's make it relevant. I want to romanticize the past. You saw my wife up here. I love my wife. I'll be married to her 28 years in July. So let's go back into the time warp, back into 1989. When my wife and I, I just graduated high school, we weren't quite engaged yet, but we had the kind of the promise thing going on. We've been dating for almost four years. Look at me. What a stud am I. Goodness. <laughs> for my Greensboro peeps, my Carolina Tar Heel shirt is on. My wife is, my wife is remarkably the same as she is today. And, and I look a lot like my son, according to a lot of people. My son's on the front row here, and he's like, oh, please, God, is this what I have to look forward to? Yes, it is. 
Congratulations. So have you ever thought of Mary and Joseph? We romanticize that, right? They're doing the right things, making the right choices, and Mary comes to Joseph and says, oh, by the way, I'm pregnant, and it's God's fault. Now, if I was dating Javon at the time, and we were ready to get married, and she comes to me because she was so innocent and pure, and said, hey, Brent, by the way, I'm so sorry to tell you this, but I'm, I'm, I'm excited as well. Um, I'm pregnant by God. Guys, how would you handle that? I mean, I, I, would, I would struggle a little bit with that. Would anyone struggle? We don't, we're like, I don't really think of it in that terms. Way to just totally kill the whole Mary and Joseph thing in my mind now. Because you know what? We were dating. I'm sure Mary and Joseph were probably a little bit younger than that when this happened. But it was basically like Giovanna. We romanticized the past. I always do this with my wife. I romanticize when we were newlyweds and we went away to college in Indiana. And, she, and I always tell her, I'm like, oh, wouldn't it be great to just go back there? We didn't have a lot of responsibility. We were just, um, we were in love and we lived in that little apartment right off the campus in Marion, Indiana, where we had the shag carpet. And when friends came over, we got a rake from the Home Depot and you actually raked the shag. Who did that? Remember raking the shag carpet? And we had a heat that was either on or off, no thermostat. So we had a free, this was the late 80s, early 90s, we had a free-flowing waterbed. How many had the waterbed? Think of Javonna's size and my size. If I flipped over, she hit the ceiling, right? Boom! I'll catch you, right? And so every morning in Indiana, it's freezing. We have no thermostat. We, we're in this warm waterbed. We turn the heat off at night. We do paper, rock, scissors in the morning. Who's going get to up, get up, run into the other room, flip on the heater, and run back into the bed because it's freezing? We literally came home from church one night, and our toilet water was frozen. <laughs> we had no money. We walked to Walmart for fun. And so I tell my wife this, and she looks at me. She goes, Britt, you're crazy. You want to go back then? You're romanticizing that. That wasn't all that much fun. <laughs> My son just got his driver's license. He's now driving on the road. Yeah, yeah, I know. You're like, just tell me what road and I'll go the other way. Right, I got you. Okay, good driver. He's 15. My daughter's married. I'm going through that midlife. I'm like, honey, I, man, I'm going to hate this. Kids are going to be out before we know it. Maybe we should adopt triplets or something. <laughs> She's like, are you crazy? Something's wrong with you. I'll show you a picture of my kids. These were my children when they were born. That's Miranda on the left. That's my boy right there on the right. Um, yeah, I guess what, whatever, your way, my way, whatever. Um, I romanticize these moments, right? Javonna's like, are you nuts? Isn't it great that they're all, kick Mason, get him a job. Let him, he's almost, he's 15, you know? Start working, pay rent, do whatever. She's like, do you remember the sleepless nights? Changing of diapers? I mean, Miranda was okay, but Mason was a boy. You may change his diaper. He was old faithful. I mean, it got in my mouth. <laughs> my, my wife, I was watching a Jim Gaffigan comedy special. Who likes Jim Gaffigan, you know? And he was talking about, hey, I just became a parent. And everybody's, ah, for the fourth time. And people like, he says, people don't tend to clap after you say you have four kids. <laughs> what? Are you Amish? I mean, it's one of those... And he's like, you know what? Ha, ha, you know how it is to have four children? You know what it's like? He goes, imagine yourself drowning, and then I'm going to hand you a baby. Right? I mean, that's how it is with four kids. And he goes, my wife, and you know what? I can relate because it's the same thing. He goes, my wife had the open bed policy. If your kids got scared, they would come in and they could lay down with you. And he goes, do you remember that? When your kids came in and all of a sudden you would wake up and one of your children wet the bed? And I can vividly remember my kids. I don't, I'm sure it was both of them. All of a sudden you wake up and they wet the bed and you, you're startled. And you're like, did I wet the bed? I mean, what is going on? And then you as a husband, you're trying to scooch over to the far corner of the bed to try to get away from the wetness. You know, you know what I'm talking about? And you're hoping your wife wakes up and cleans it up and you're just going like, oh, I'll just lay here, whatever. It doesn't matter. And so my wife reminds me of that often. We romanticize things. We, we have very um, things that we call nostalgic. That is Mary, the mother of Jesus, especially because we only really talk about her at Christmas time. And so we're nostalgic about that. We think, wow, but have you ever really thought about the lessons you can learn from her life? She came from a good home. She did the right things. The Bible, we're going to read it here, that says she was blessed and highly favored sometimes as a human, I'm like, how highly favored are you, Mary? So let, let's read it and let's just kind of bring this to life. Luke chapter 1, 
Verse 26, some of you know this. This is God's plan for Mary. I read this every year. It's the Christmas story. God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings. You are what? Say it with me. You are you are highly favored. Can you do that? Go, ha. Come on, Hi. Favored, right? Okay, so I'm thinking if I'm highly favored, where's the car? Do I get, uh, we're fixing to get married. Where's the new house? I'm sure it's in the, the west part of Jerusalem because we know everybody, that's anybody lives in West Knoxville. So it's got to be in the west part. Of, I mean, and y'all get that later, right? Um, you're highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was, I love this. We read this just kind of like, okay, we'll read it. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. I would be greatly troubled. But the angel said to her, hey, don't be afraid. It's okay. God has found favor with you. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you will call him Jesus. So you're going to bear the Messiah. You're going to call him. You're going to be called loved. People are going to revere you. That sounds great. That's awesome. But wait a minute. You know, Matthew 1.18, his mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. That word pledge is a huge word. When they were pledged to one another, that almost means legally in some ways they were married to one another. Although during that year of being pledged, we'll call it their fiance, their engagement year, they had little or no contact with each other. Because the legal implication was they were pretty much married. Now, guess what? Back in that day, they looked at fornication and adultery a little bit differently. If you have a small child in here and they go on, they're on their way home and they're like, hey, mom, what's fornication? That's on you. They should have been in kids 22-6, but that's okay. You have that conversation for Mother's Day. That'll be great. Hey, what's fornication, mom? Okay, um, anyway, they looked at that badly. Do you know that? You could have been put to death if you committed adultery or um, an act of fornication, even if it looked like you were doing some wrong things. They didn't take that too kindly. So when the angel said, hey, I got some good news, good news, he didn't tell Mary like the whole story, did he? Mary, did you know? Mary did not know that during her pregnancy, no one's going to believe her. If my teenage daughter came to me, if you're a mom and dad in this room, raise your hand up with a teenage girl. Hey, mom and dad, I'm pregnant. God did it. <laughs> Who's believing her? Raise your hand. Who's up? I'm, a, I'm not. I'm just not. You're like, well, you're not very spiritual. No, I'm not. I'm not, right? I mean, that would be nobody. Your reputation is going to be shot. You can hear the old ladies in the community now. I can't believe that she was such a good girl. What a horrible person she is. Your friends are going to abandon you. You know that. You know that happened. And now um, your husband, he's not going to take you on Jerry Springer. He... Some of you are like, you are ruining this story for me now. <laughs> Next year at Christmas, this is all going to, I can't even. He's going to be a stand-up guy, but he's also going to do what? Matthew 1, 19, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man, he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. Wow, what a stand-up guy. So he had in mind to just kind of divorce her, just to kind of walk away from her quietly. So I thought Mary was highly favored. Now everything seems to be falling apart. God does intervene, verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. You're like, well, that's awesome, excellent. God intervened. I wish God would do that. I wish with everything that's going on in my life, I'll go to sleep tonight. God will give me a dream. It'll all be good. But that didn't fix everything, did it? I mean, if Mary had such favor with God, why is her life going to be so difficult? I mean, back to Luke chapter 1, verse 28. The angel went to her and said, I mean, he keeps saying it. Greetings. You are highly favored, right? The Lord is with you. If it's just me, I'm thinking, wait a minute. If God is with me, please show me a lot more kindness. Would anybody else agree? 
Mary's nine months pregnant, and guess what? She now has to travel to Bethlehem. Is there anybody in this room that's ever traveled with a pregnant lady before anywhere? I've seen every rest area, restroom, rest stop, gas station, any along the way. I've been puked on. And that's in a car. Mary, I don't, according to the scripture, was, she was not in a Cadillac. I read nowhere that she was on a four-wheeler. I mean, they had to travel. You think about that. I mean, some of you are like, Brent, you've gone crazy. Well, think about it. Herod attempts to kill Jesus, so Joseph and Mary have to flee to what? After, after Jesus is born, I mean, it, you think, okay, all right, finally, things are going to settle down. The Son of God is here, Emmanuel, but yet they have to flee to Egypt. I'm sure that was a great time of relaxation. It's like going to Canada with better weather. That's pretty much what that means to me. I mean, isn't this Jesus at his most vulnerable state as an infant? I mean, why couldn't God take care of Herod? I sometimes think that. Why wouldn't God just call up the guys from Jersey and say, take care of this for me. Take care of this Herod guy. Bada bang bada. I mean, I would say Newport, but I would get in trouble. Why wouldn't God just call? So, anyway. But that's, that's what we want God to do for us, right? We wake up tomorrow and things are going bad, whether it's in our family, whether it's our job, whether it's our health. And we're like, God, can you make all things better? I thought you wanted me blessed and highly favored. Here's what I'm thinking. Long story short, I think sometimes, and maybe I think wrongly, I know it's kind of wrong, that life's circumstances either equals favor or disfavor with God. Life circumstances either favor or disfavor with God, but that's not really the truth. If you look at the story of Mary, you know that Mary and Joseph might have come to the conclusion that God was not with them, that his blessing was not on them, but God walked closely with them and he made a way for them where there seems to be no way. God takes them out of impossible situations because in spite of life's bad stuff, God's will for them is going to get done. That's the same for me and that's the same for you. Spiritual insight. Here we go. Ready? God's way is probably never the way we would expect. God's way is never the way we would expect. God's timing is never kind of our timing. His time never fits our timeline. And God's blessing, this is important to listen to. And it's really right here. Um, we can relate to this story. God's blessing is not the same as what we think of blessings. We think of blessings as good health, solid relationships, close family, a safe place to live, so on and so on. All the stuff that we can touch. But here's what I'm going to say, and this might floor you a little bit. God knows that's really not what we're looking for. I've come to the conclusion in my life, the longer that I live, here's what we really seek. We seek freedom and we seek peace. A freedom and a peace that no matter what our circumstances are, it's not good circumstances that make a godly life, a solid life, a life that's blessed. People who are in God's favor tend to have difficulties in life. But God makes a way where there seems to be no way. The true blessings of God are deeper than, than I have expected, than you can expect. Spiritual result, freedom. It doesn't matter. Listen to me. This is it. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life right now. You don't have to be bound by it. Spiritual result, peace. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life right now. God will follow through. He will make a way where there seems to be no way. He has already made a way. Psalm 130 verse 7 is a verse that I've been dwelling on in my personal life. O Israel, put your hope, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is what? Unfailing love. And with him is full, what? Redemption. Redeemed. That God loves you. So how do we put it all together? Here's what I know. I know that there are ladies in our church that will not be at church this week because it's Mother's Day week. Because just as we dedicated a child and said, hey, God, every perfect gift comes from above. It comes from you. Um, we celebrate the gift of life. There are some ladies in our church that have not been able to have a child. And this, look at me, this week devastates them. 
And they're like, God, what kind of purpose and plan do you have for me? Man, my life is not blessed and my life is maybe not favored. And there's a lot of us, there are some single moms in this room. It's like your husband has not done what he should have done and walked away. Maybe there are some single, you, you, you as a mom, you walked away. Maybe there's been a falling apart in a relationship and you started to walk that road and you're like, now I have to, now life tends to get difficult. But wait a minute, um, God's mercies are new every morning. God is a God of a second chance. It's not just our DNA. The choices that we make determine who we are and we can choose to just do what Mary did and what was the secret to Mary and Joseph and God meeting their needs and making a way. They were what? Faithful and they were obedient. We tend to look at this story so benign and we don't really add two and two together how God made a way when we didn't even know God was making a way. Hey, for instance, the wise men show up and they give them gifts, right? Of what? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And you're like, oh, that's so symbolic of a royal king. No, you, what, what were they? They were high value commodities. How do you think when they fled to Egypt, how do you think they lived? Sold the gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. God made a way where, even a practical way, where there seemed to be no way. We tend to look at this story through this kind of nostalgic lens and we romanticize it. But can you imagine a young girl would now become a mother? And her life, as she knew it, would change. It would fall apart, but God would work all things together together. But even though her life was difficult, from the birth of Christ all the way to the death of Christ on the cross, Mary would be there. And she would simply walk in faith and she would walk in obedience. From birth to death, what about our lives? When we accept Christ, we're born again as a follower of Jesus Christ till the time that we die. Can that be said of us? We're going to be people of faith and obedience. It's not the favor and the blessings we think of as the stuff. It's the freedom that we don't have to be bound by our circumstances. And it's peace that passes all understanding. I did a funeral on Friday of a lady who sat in this service week after week for several years. It seems like since my dad died, every funeral that I do, I I tend to try to uh, put myself more in the family's shoes. The lady, um, I I did kind of, sometimes I'm I'm a little lighthearted at funerals just to try to break the ice, especially when I know that they are Christians because I know that we are not mourning without hope, that we have hope in Jesus Christ and that she is very much alive today in the arms of her Lord and Savior, and I know that. But she came to church and I knew her as Virginia. Well, I found out from her family as I was researching her funeral that all of the people that she loved and loved her called her Chris. But the pastor got to call her Virginia. So I guess she didn't love me that much. I mean, I was, you know, I made a little fun of that. She was 72 years old. She had foot surgery. Because of that foot issue, she tried to get up. Her daughter had left the house for just a moment. She fell and hit her nose because of the the fall. um, Cardiac arrest uh, happened and she died. She was 72. My dad was 73 when he fell in my yard. And 10 days later, he died. Both of her parents were in ministry. Both of my parents are in ministry. We're in ministry. And I, I could relate. And I looked at them and I stood there on the front row and I said, listen, we are not here mourning without hope. We know that God made a way for us where there seemed to be no way. And that free gift of salvation, just the faith that we have to understand that gift and the obedience that we have to walk in salvation is our hope. God does make a way. So listen, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, no matter your circumstances, you are blessed and you are highly favored. And you better not walk out of here feeling insignificant. No matter what's going on in your life, you better understand one important thing. God loves you more than you know. He loves you. No matter the bad choices, no matter the sin DNA, no matter the world in which we live of sin, death, and disease, I hear it all the time. Why do bad things happen to so many good people? I can easily say we live in a world of sin, death, and disease. We do not know what tomorrow holds, but because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross for us, I know that my bad choices, the sins in my life can be washed white as snow. 
That's God making a way where there seems to be no way. Make sure that you always think about walking in faith and not by sight. Let's pray. God, thank you for this opportunity to be in church this week. I love that we can celebrate as a family. It's been such a good service. I love that we can look into your word and we can relate to Mary. And I know we typically just put her in this nostalgic lens and it's pretty much right at Christmas. But what a story that we can learn from. We always think we're blessed and favored when everything is perfect. And, but yet yeah, we know that your ways are higher than our ways. Your timing is different than our timing. And you know what? Blessing is much deeper than we think. May we not keep it surfacey and sightful, but may we look to you, the author and perfecter of our faith, and allow our faith as we continue to walk in faith in our life to collide. God, use this moment in a powerful way. In Jesus' name I pray.